The next one? Sure. Okay. Yeah, if you'd like to introduce yourself too, no? Oh, yeah. That might be a, a great time to do it. Okay. My name's Avon, and I've been playing violin for seven years. Yeah, that's it. All right. Well, take it away, Avon. Started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to September's uh, Ward 5 NPA meeting. Um, thank you all for coming. This is the first of our um, in person meetings, so we have this new fun space. <laughs> Sorry about that. New fun that. space for us to get feedback in. Um, I wish we could show it to you, but we have this amazing new technology that um, I don't know if it's that new, but it's this amazing new computer technology that um, allows us to um, show us this whole room and, and, and work with this hybrid model. So uh, we're just going to start by kind of introducing some of the principles of, of the NPA. Um, as many of you may know, the whole purpose of, or one of the many purposes of the NPA is to be um, a neighborhood institution that uh, provides a lot of different services for, for residents of the South End. Um, and the city wide as well. Um, but some of the things that we're trying to create in our space is that we're trying to create a safe space um, and a welcoming forum for all folks to be able to join and participate however they would like to. We'd like it to be accessible for our neighbors, cultivating involvement from a diverse spectrum of community members. Um, we're trying to be respectful, inclusive, culturally and economically aware. Um, we're trying to be vital, we're trying to be fun. We had an amazing performance by um, a young musician in Avon Jorgensen, uh, some of you may have seen as we were getting started. Um, and that's just one of the things that we're trying to keep it as, as a part of these meetings. Um, we're, we value varied perspectives and we're always nonpartisan and we do not uh, endorse political candidates. Um, as, as some of you may know, the way the MPA is set up is that if you're a member of, of the Ward 5 community, you're a member of the MPA community as well. Um, Really, this is, this is a community-wide uh, type of thing, but we're also organized by a steering committee, but, um, which is made up of, are, are we eight members now? Yeah, we, we have an eight-member steering committee mem uh, committee with myself, Nate Lantieri, who will be, I'll be hosting throughout the rest of the hour and a half, but we have, we're joined by a few other members of the steering committee in the room. We have Joe Derry, and uh, virtually we have Shirsten Bohm, and uh, I saw Lucia, there's many folks, um, and the whole list is, is on the screen as well. Um, something that I'd like to plug, too, aside from the Burlington.gov link that you'll see at the bottom, 
We're also working on creating a new website, which is found at npa5.org. And um, one of the purposes of creating this new website is to try and really be a community resource. It can be a landing page for, for uh, a number of different things. So keep, keep this in the back of your mind as we're adding new features to it over the next few months. Um, we, we will be reaching out to the community and, and letting folks know as those come online as well. Uh, yeah, next, next slide. As part of this hybrid model, uh, we're still using Zoom. Seems like we will be using Zoom for a while, so it's always good to just get a refresher on, on the way that we organize these meetings. If you are a participant and you'd like to participate, um, just press the raise hand button that can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will uh, try and recognize that and, and give you an opportunity to speak. If, you are, um, if you've raised your hand and you've become a presenter, then you have the opportunity to uh, unmute your mic and start your video. Um, as you're not speaking, just remember to please unmute yourself. If you'd like to keep your video on and you're still in the presenter mode, that's, that's okay. But um, do please try and uh, un uh, keep your mic muted when you're not speaking. it for slides. Oh, we have the agenda. So for the rest of the, the this is what we're working with with uh, our meetings tonight and, and the next slide I'll show you what we're working with for next month's meeting. Um, we started with our performance by Avon. We're going to shortly after we finish up this introduction move into a public forum, a, a chance for folks to share whatever they may be thinking of. We will then uh, move into the session that we're having on redistricting. As, as we get into that, I'll explain a little bit more about it. Um, ultimately, citywide, we are hoping to create an ad hoc committee on redistricting, and each ward has a member, um, and we will be selecting our member tonight. Following that, we'll have some uh, back-to-school updates from uh, several of our, our South End uh, school representatives. We have Joe Restigini, who's the principal of Champlain Elementary, as well as the two school board members for Ward 5. We have Mike Fisher, who is the Ward 5 member, and Jeff Wick, who is the South End member. After that, we'll have an update from Kevin Pounds, the director of A New Place, regarding um, the going-ons of Champlain Inn, and then we will finish up with an update on the City of Burlington's capital plan from Martha Keenan, who is in the clerk's treasurer's office. Looking forward a little bit to next month. Um, still putting together to the agenda, but here are some of the highlights of what we um, ultimately will be looking at. We'll have some updates from city councilors, an update on the net zero energy revenue bond, as well as some updates on Champlain Street Park. Um, in addition, we're also seeking musicians. As I've mentioned a few times, we had a great performer today. If you or someone you know would be willing to do you know, a short 10 minute presentation, we'd love to have you on um, and, and get you a chance to perform in front of the community. So that's what we're looking at for October. Let's uh, bring it on back to September. With that, we have uh, entered our, oh, it looks like our video is off. We're back. <laughs> was our audio on? <laughs> our audio is definitely on. Um, we hear you. So we're back in our room, our hybrid room. Thank you all again for coming. With that, I'll open up the public forum. If, if any members of the public would like to share, now, now is a great opportunity to do so. Remember, you can use that raise hand function on Zoom. If, if you're in the room and you'd like to press the raise hand function, you don't have to press the button, you just raise your hand. <laughs> so you get a couple cheesy jokes for the new hybrid model. Hi, Andy. So would anybody, uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to share for public forum? Again, now is the, is the chance to do so. I do. All right. I, I just want to point out to people, I want to mention the fact that we have a meeting on October 21st um, with our next meeting here, if conditions permit. And I also wanted to point out the beautiful mural that's happening by Juniper Creative at um, 339 Pine Street, just down the street, uh, that I, I haven't looked in the last few days, but they were still working on it. 
and it was absolutely gorgeous. They've gotten feedback from the community about their other murals and are trying to incorporate, according to them, um, more images of uh, young people in our community and not just uh, you know, their daughter and idealized uh, people of color, but people in our community who uh, they've, they've met and worked with. So I just, I just like to highlight their work. It's so beautiful and so vibrant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Andy. Yeah, that's the new mural going up on, on Pine Street. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, it's really cool watching the way that they actually make that happen. Um, they project it onto the wall. It's cool. This was a really cool part of our job um, to see that. Anybody else have anything for, for public forum that they'd like to share? It looks like Jane is raising her hand. Jane, you can uh, unmute yourself. OK, thanks. Yeah. Um I'd like to say that um, being in the South, I mean, um, that, 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 that being in the South has a disadvantage in that, in, 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 in that, recycle, in that our recycling day, Monday, often, often, um, we, we often catch the, the catch hol 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 holidays and and it, and it can and it's a hard and, and it can be a, and, and that can be a, and that can be a hardship sometimes waiting for another week especially when you when you live in let's see, when you live in a multi unit 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 Sorry, development with, with only a certain number of 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 of, of, the, of, of this um, so I mean I, I wish there was a way around that I know in the very beginning remember in the very beginning in the beginning of the cycle, they, 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 they did have another day, but I, but I think it was just too hard for, for, for the city to do, to do that. But, uh, but you know, and, 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 and that's actually mine, and some, and some of the some places have forgotten, and forget. Or I guess, like, and maybe, well, I guess it should just be better public, maybe just publicize it each time. And, Somebody comes at each time. There's no recycling on one, or no recycling on on this holiday. I mean, we on 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 some certain holidays because I think the Howard Center forgets. But I'm trying to tell them that sometimes what I've seen that seen there's stuff out there put out there on on the Labor Day or on the Memorial Day. Well, thank you for sharing, Jane. Um, definitely empathize with that. Does anybody else have any uh, anything that they would like to present as part of the public forum session of the meeting? Hi, I, I do. Sure, Amanda, it's the the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Just, just two quick things um, for anyone that that lives um, in in the South End. Well, we all live in the South End area, but the area that's heavily impacted by um, the the roundabout project. Um, if you have concerns. Please reach out because I, I I believe my building is going to be meeting with um, with the state and city next week. We we have some concerns. I mean, I think a lot of things are going really well with that project, but there's some things that we're hoping to, to see resolved. So if someone else has has a, an interest in this, um, please reach out. Um, I can leave my my email in the, the chat box. And the, the other thing is, I, I, I'm just hoping that people will, whatever your position is on, on the policing issue, um, that people will write to their counselors on what their goals are. Because this, with the CNN report being released, this, this conversation is, is rapidly emerging right now. And so whatever your values are, it's, it's really important to, to weigh in and, and let your, your counselors and the counselor, counselor at large know what you're thinking and what you need. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing all that. And yeah, yes. definitely do put your email in the chat and uh, we, can, we can pass that on as part of the notes as well. Uh, do, does anybody else have anything that they would like to share as part of public forum? Yeah, it looks like we have a hand raised for, for A, good drum. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess I, I just want to say I think the reason um, that we are really here 
is because we were hoping to start or continue a conversation about where we are headed with the homeless encampment that exists on Sears Lane um, that has grown exponentially over the past couple of years. And um, as someone who lives in Lakeside neighborhood is um, definitely causing some problems for us. Um, and I, I don't know where the conversation stands, but the reason we're here is to to try to start a conversation about it. Um, I'm hoping that we are, there's a plan heading somewhere um, with what we're doing because um, things are getting a little bit out of control over there. Sure thing, and, and thanks for sharing. Is, is there a good way to, to get in touch with you if, if folks would like to follow up? Um, certainly, I, I can put my um, email address, I guess, in the chat. Perfect. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, and what was your first name as well? Ashley. Ashley, thanks for sharing. Thank you. And anything else as, as part of public forum that someone would like to share? I'll just mention quickly, Nate, it looks like, um, you know, Parks and Rec is kind of in the final stages of the master plan for Callahan Park. Um, and um, there's a virtual public meeting and an online survey, but they'll also be tabling in the park from September 18th to the 25th. So if folks wanna come by and talk with them um, about, I guess, print plans and inspiring photos that can help um, community members understand what's envisioned. I don't know the specific times that they're tabling, but I imagine it's probably available on Parks and Rec website. Thanks, Jerson. Um, picking up the slack for me on the Parks and Rec Committee. You got the update before. <laughs> um, I, I have one update as well. Um, in my time outside of the MPA, I also work at a CVO, you know, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. And um, we're helping folks who are eligible to apply for the what's called the VRAP program, the Vermont Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, it's really flexible money that folks are able to apply for, renters are able to apply for. Um, if you find yourself behind on rent or find yourself behind on utilities or really have any expenses related to housing um, as a result of, of economic burdens that um, have come through the past year. So if you or someone that you know th think may be able to use that program, please um, you do recommend it to them. Do recommend the community action, uh, the community action folks at CVOEO. They're, they're really happy to help. It's a little bit of a challenging program at times in terms of some of, some of the documents, but um, a lot of money is going out and helping people uh, just stay in stable housing. So if you know somebody or you or yourself would, would qualify for that, do please reach out to Community Action um, because the money's there. Would anybody else like to share anything as part of public forum? Hey, I just want to ask you a question. Sure. Um, so the eligibility, um, the, you can self-attest, right, yes. now, yep. so you don't have to produce reams of yep. documentation yep. to prove income exactly. eligibility, et yeah. cetera. So that, that streamlines the process, yeah. I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And, and what Tiff was just saying um, is that there are, are some flexibilities in, in what documents you actually do need to provide. Um, some certain income documentations and things like that, you can do a self-attestation of your income if, if it's too burdensome to, to produce those documents. So thanks for sharing that point, too. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else for, for public forum? Check the gallery view. Look like I'm missing any hands, and that's right on time to move on to our next piece, which is on redistricting. So. This beginning section, you're going to hear my voice a lot, and then slowly I will fade away, and we'll we'll get to the really the great presenters. But um, as part of uh, the recent census data that has come out, the 2020 census data, the city is looking to create an ad hoc committee, which is a, a committee that's formed just for this specific purpose, to gather public input on what the community would like to see regarding redistricting. Um, this is not going to be a a binding committee. It's not something that is going to draw the map in the next month or so. The whole purpose of this is to really gather community input and um, see how folks in, you know, not just Ward 5, but citywide are feeling about the process of redistricting. And as part of this committee, uh, 
the city council has tasked the MPAs with um, selecting a member from each ward in order to serve on this committee. So we're doing that tonight. We're actually the last of the eight wards in order to do that. So um, we have had a few folks who are interested in participating in this. If anybody in the audience is also interested in participating, um, that's definitely fine as well. We will, uh, after we've given each of the interested applicants uh, a chance to share a little bit about themselves, we will uh, conduct a vote and that will be, it's a hybrid vote too. You know, we don't just get the benefit of just having a hybrid meeting, we've got a hybrid vote too. So we will be doing it uh, in person via paper ballot and then uh, digitally via a Google form, which uh, I, be I believe one of the folks that's living in Zoom land has got that. It looks like sherson has got that. So um, be on the lookout in the chat after the session wraps up. We will cross tabulate these two things afterwards. Um, and then we'll announce the winner, you know, the, the selected community volunteer to, to be able to serve on that. Um, and we'll announce that after the back to school updates. So I will uh, open the floor right now. I, I know that uh, there are two folks who are interested. I know at least one of them is here. Um, so I'll give Bill Kehoe an opportunity to um, you know, say a little bit about himself. In addition to Bill, we've also received interest from Gregory Scheffler. Are you Gregory Scheffler? No, I'm no. right here. There you're Gregory Scheffler, all right. So, and, and in addition, if anybody that is in the audience will hear or um, on Zoom, if, if you'd like to participate uh, after we give these two folks a, a chance to present, um, feel free to raise your hand and, and we can do that. Or, or even raise your hand now just so that we get it you know, on our minds that, that there are more folks. So, so Bill, the floor is yours. Okay. Do you mind going towards the microphone? That'll help. Can we move the, the mic toward? Do the mic? <coughs> There's lots of them. Hi, my name is Bill Key. I've been around the South End for a long time. Uh, I'd just like this opportunity to serve on, the, uh, on this committee because I think it's a, a grassroots committee that needs uh, someone representing the South End who knows the South End, who's lived in the South End a long time. <clears throat> As you may know, I've been an elected official from the South End for 16 years. Uh, I've been a department head in Burlington for six years, and I've just been around the block. I just think I'd be a good candidate for this process. I think it's going to be a meaningful process and a long process. It's going to end up in the legislature, and the Government Operations Committee is going to fool around with it, but we're starting here. I think it's important that you have someone who represents the South End and is experienced in the city. So if you have any questions, here I am. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So I'll zoom us back up. And uh, Gregory, could you uh, step towards one of the mics as well? The floor is yours. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is uh, Greg Shepler. Well, first of all, if I would have known that Bill was running, I would not be here at all. <laughs> I think he's a great candidate. I've been uh, reading his columns uh, for years, and he is the best person for the job. So I would encourage the, uh, the, the NPA to select him for that. I kept seeing uh, the Jimmy, it's a paid political announcement. <laughs> I kept seeing the the ad in uh, front porch form. So, um, and I just recently retired from uh, 33 years of teaching history on the high school level, and have been advocating uh, democratic uh, involvement and participation for years. And uh, it was an opportunity uh, for me to. Uh, exercise that and uh, express that in a action format. Uh, in addition, uh, I have a law degree and um, it, this is a legal issue and uh, I just am fascinated with the law and how uh, it uh, works and impacts our lives. Uh, but Bill's the best person for the job, so go for him. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, we, we have a, a question from, from the audience, which is it's from Andy. Well, I actually have several questions. Sure. One, one question is, can this job be shared um, by uh, job shared? Because I think both candidates who've spoken are 
extremely qualified and obviously have um, uh, uh, share, share a point of view, if I might generalize, and, um, and experience. So I, I'm wondering if that is at least a possibility. <clears throat> um, and um, I'm interested in more information about, because I'm not completely up to date about where we are uh, in terms of census information and what we found out so far about the census data that's going to inform this, uh, the work of this committee. And my third question, actually, I realize, um, is one that uh, Charlie, who was filming this meeting, brought up uh, in the in the NPA forum: is um, what's the rush? You know, why are we why are we in such a hurry to get this uh, done? If this is indeed an important decision about how the redistricting happens in Burlington, um, why, is, why is there such a hurry? Um, uh, can't it be extended for a longer period of time so that we could, so that the people who are involved, be they volunteers from the NPAs or um, uh, city councilors or others, uh, or the general public, be able to express uh, and explore all the different possibilities for the redistricting and not be uh, crunched into a time period which seems incredibly short given the fact that the last time that we went through the redistricting process it took quite a while. Um, I'm hoping that it won't be as contentious as it was the last time, but, um, but there certainly are lots of things to consider. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking those points, Andy. Um, and I think I can, I can attempt to answer a few of them and, and I'll also you know, lean a little bit on, on Kristen, um, who is the fantastic uh, MPA staff person from, from the CETO office. Um, regarding the number of members, I think it has a number certain within the city council's proposal of, of eight, one from each ward in particular. So I do think we would have to select one. Um, Even if there were only one vote among shared by UP. Say that again? Even if there were if if there was voting in the in the group of volunteers, even if the Ward Five only had one vote, um, could it not be shared by two people? I'm I'm just putting that out there in case there's interest. Ward Three only an alternate. An alternate? Oh, okay. Yeah. So so that is something that we could potentially look at if, yeah. if it's something that I thought I might have been mixing that up with a different discussion, but uh, I remember there being there being the potential for an alternate. Yeah. Right. Well, there we go. That's, that's a path forward on that one. Um, and regarding the latest data, it was actually presented to the City Council on uh, Monday. And from the previous uh, re uh, redistricting, it was a 10% threshold that needed to be reached in order to do the redistricting. And they found that Wars 1 was 10% larger than the standard, and Wars 7 was 10% smaller than the, than the what was determined to be the average. So presumably that would mean that some form of redistricting needs to move forward. Regarding the timeline, I think the expediency on this is not for the sake of getting right to it, but getting to the process of collecting input on, on, on what the community's appetite is for this. Kristen, do you, do you have anything? I think those are all good answers, yeah. <laughs> The timeline that we're working with is just what's proposed by the city councilors, and it's come up before in some of the other forums. Like, what if like the representatives on this committee don't like this timeline? They could work together and, and go back to city council and ask for an extension. Like, that's always an option. Um, but I think the thought was to. I know the last redistricting was a long process, so I think the thought was having a timeline could help just keep things moving forward, but I definitely hear your concerns about it feeling rushed. And I saw a raised hand over here. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, I'm Fred Schmidt. I've lived here for over 40 years, not in the South End. I ran the Center for Rural Studies and we were the center for the census. Um, I don't particularly want to serve on a, on a committee with no mandate. <laughs> and no power, which is what this sounds like. But I'd sure like to be part of a discussion. I know a little bit about Chris and certainly Bill Kiel's a 
been here forever, and uh, I think you both got some insights, but I'd like to have a little bit of discussion. It's important. You know, it's a, it's a numbers game. We got the 22 election ahead of us. We're going to have some contentious elections right here in this city. That's pretty clear. Um, so I, I, I would like to see a little bit more discussion around it. One vote, shared vote, whatever. But we need to get something out on the, on the front porch forum and have a little dialogue about it, because there are a lot of problems with this census. Um, as you all doubt, right. <laughs> doubtedly right. know. Right. Plus, the major, the, the agency head has still not been removed by Biden, so right. we're not getting any cooperation out of Washington. Right. And actually, excuse me, yeah, what was right. the data you were, you had the table up. I emailed the secretary of that committee and asked for the data presentation, and I never got an answer, but yeah, I did. Yeah, you said that on Monday. Yeah, the Monday city council meeting. Right, that's what I tried to get yeah. over. But the, you said something about uh, Ward 7 was 10 yeah. above, 10 percentage above what? Uh, from the standard deviation. Or 10. You mean in terms of head counts? See, this is what I mean. Yeah, devi so, deviation between deviation most and population. least populous ward. So, so the idea being that the wards would all be equal, ward one being slightly larger, ward seven being slightly smaller, or 10% in, in either direction. So you, it's total population yeah. then you're looking at. Yeah. Okay, not voters, <coughs> not 21 years old. Yeah, total, total, total population. Total po okay. total Sorry. population. Yeah. <coughs> because uh, the return rates were so incredibly important, and we worked statewide on return rate, and it was miserable. We had six, only 60% turnout midsummer last year. So um, it'd be interesting to know what the ward turn, what the turnout was to participate in this yeah. census. Yeah, and I, and I recommend all folks if if you'd like to learn a little bit more about um, you know what what has come out of the 2020 census so far. Um, if you check the Burlington Board Docs website. Um, there was a pre presentation by the, uh, the planning office on Monday during the regular city council meeting that was uh, a, basically a distillation of, of that data that came out. Great. That's what I was looking for. And uh, I know that I, I saw a hand raise from Amanda previously. Amanda, would, would you still like to sh uh, I don't see her in the Zoom. Oh, yes, I still do. Amanda, would you still like to, to share? No, I, I just, I was wondering um, if, you, you both uh, are, are, are very well qualified, and this is not a pointed question, just out of curiosity, though. I know one of the questions coming up as we redistrict is, has, has creating um, district-wide uh, counselor positions, has that been successful? Um, so, it, it, like, where, for example, I have Chip Mason representing me in Ward 5. I also have Joan Shannon for, for the, the South District. So how do you guys feel about how that's worked to have um, the, the broader district positions? Yeah, I mean, I, I just really quick to say one thing about this position, which I think you said, but just to articulate it um, again, is that the primary role of the committee is to take public input and gather community input into the process. So it's more about organizing opportunities for people to have these really important conversations um, going forward to, to the question about timeline and about kind of content. I don't want to miss Amanda's question, but just also being mindful of time, just to, just to reiterate that, that the primary role of this position is to, to gather this type of community input and to organize um, sessions like this to have these conversations. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Sherston. Um, yeah, it's, it's, the goal of the committee is primarily outreach and, and gathering feedback. Um, but so we're, we're actually over time on the agenda for uh, this item, but it also looks like we don't yet have uh, unless they're in the attendees list. No, they are not. It looks like, um, uh, Mike, while we, I, I see you're here, are, are you going to be joined by the other the other two? Oh, I see one, there's Joe. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Jeff Wick won't be able to make it tonight. Okay, all right. So 
with that note, I think that for, for the sake of time, and, unless either of you would like to very briefly talk about the ward versus district breakdown, otherwise we can, we can move on and provide people the opportunity to vote. And, and if, it's, if it's a situation where whoever receives the most votes is interested in being the lead and the other person being the alternate, um, that could be something that we move forward with. I don't know, did we actually have a conceit, perhaps, during the <laughs> presentation? Uh, conceit for? Well, I just suggest, uh, Mr. Schiffler suggested that Bill be oh, yeah. elected into the position. Yeah, would, would you like to I, 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 I think Bill is the best, as I said, and I've met with all due respect uh, for the, uh, I mean, he's, I don't know how long he's been in the South District. I've been in Vermont for 40 years, been living in the South District for 20. He's probably been here all his life. He knows everyone. If the, if the task of the organization is community input, he is the known commodity. And so I think he would be the best person for the job. So I'm willing to step down. I'm willing to serve as an alternate if something comes up and, and prevents uh, the work that he's certainly capable of performing, I'm willing to step in at that point. But uh, I do believe that he is the best person for the job. All right. Well, with that as a consideration, this, this as a last beat. Uh, yeah. I just want to add to that. I appreciate that. And I, I, I see him as an up and coming. Uh, public servant for the South End. That's what we got to do in, in Ward 5. We have to have good people serving on city council, school board, etc., and offices like this. So I think it'd be a great alter alternate. Thank you for doing that. All right. Well, with that, I mean that that certainly makes the voting easier. But before we, you know, fully move in that direction, I just want to give one last chance for folks in the audience. Is anybody else interested in? in serving in this role or if, if I see no hands we can move in this direction and, and I guess in, in that same vein is, is anybody opposed to um, you know moving moving forward with Bill as the uh, lead on this and Greg as the alternate uh, as they have decided that their preferred roles would be no objection and seeing no hands and hearing no voices, I think that we can move in that direction. So congratulations to both of you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, many more public meetings are in your future. It was a voice so. vote. <laughs> yes. So with that, um, we can move on to the next agenda item on our list, which is a back to school update. Um, and we are joined by um, Joe Restigini, who is the principal of Champlain Elementary School and Mike Fisher, who is the uh, school board member for Ward 5. So Mike, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. And the floor is yours. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks for having us. We appreciate uh, the time uh, in your meeting. Uh, I will say, Mike, I'll see the floor to you really quickly, but I just want to mention what a beautiful Burlingtonian moment that was in the democratic process. How somebody came and, and then just stepped aside for the good of the, the people. That was really, really yeah, lovely to have some good witness too. So, Michael, I'll, I'll give it to you and you can hand it back to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. I just want to say that we, uh, Joe and I have got a little mini agenda. Uh, we're going to run through a bunch of things and then we're going to try and leave 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So, Joe, you want to start with the... the sure. So we, we started back to school on time this year, which was um, lovely to have been able to plan this entire summer for kids being in the building five days, regular schedule, and uh, teachers were ready to go prepared to receive kids the first day of school. Uh, things are still precarious in terms of our population at Champlain Elementary School and the other Burlington Elementary Schools. Uh, our population is considered the unvaccinated population at this point with the, the Delta variant kind of hovering above us. That leave, leaves us in a, in a situation where we are uh, still monitoring the daily numbers and still keeping um, 
close check on symptoms for students as they come to school, being in touch with families about taking necessary precautions, and then at the same time having less uh, regiment, regimented guidelines from, from our friends at the state level and from the Agency of Education puts us in a, a little bit of a tricky spot. But that said, uh, for, for the students at Champlain Elementary School that, that we see each day, it is really just business as usual. They have gotten used to uh, school with masks on, and there is uh, a certain level of comfort that the students have uh, really given us, extended really the, the trust in their adults to say, we understand that you're doing the right thing for us, being as safe as, as you got, possibly can to, to keep us safe. And so we're going to let the adults in the building absorb the stress, and, and we'll just learn from you. And so it feels like, like business as usual at school this year, which is a lovely thing. And uh, highlighted by uh, last week at Champlain, we did uh, get back in, into kind of the tradition of having a harvest fest on the school property. We brought a lot of South End community to Champlain Elementary School on Friday night and uh, advertised it very openly that we were expecting that adults would be responsible in modeling the right procedures and wearing masks when on the school campus with the exception of when they're eating the delicious food that's coming off the grills. And, and they did just that. It feels to me like the folks in the South End of Burlington have handled this pandemic as responsibly as they could possibly have, have modeled it really well for our students and for our younger population. And that has led to really, you know, I, I hate to, to remark on our results, but things right now, uh, yeah, all the students are in the building right now and, and we don't have uh, an influx of cases as you can see in other schools across the state. I think it's because of our mitigation strategies I, uh, we can't predict the future. We know that the variant is hovering above us. We anticipate that we will have cases and contact tracing to do, but I can say for sure that the population that uh, I am in touch with has handled this situation as uh, responsibly as, as we could have. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, everybody who we've asked to step up has stepped up. So with that, uh, I hand it over to Mike. And again, at the end, if there are questions for me, I'd be happy to help answer them. And, uh, and, and Joe, thank you. And, and you brought up a great point, which is the, the guidance from the state has been significantly less than it was last year. Uh, there was an emergency, obviously, we're operating under governor's emergency decree or orders. And this year, uh, the, the guidance has been significantly less. And a lot of school districts are struggling because the guidance is less than the CDC guidance terms of its uh, level of, of protection. So uh, we're a little bit on our own uh, in making some decisions. Um, and the board and myself are very confident that, that Joe and Superintendent Flanagan and that team, and they're, they're listening to the health experts, um, both from within Burlington and from without, and from, uh, external from Vermont, um, and making decisions. And those decisions are gonna change as, as, the, as the situation does. Um, but we, we have a lot of trust that, that the leadership of this district has made great choices in the past, and um, if we're not getting it from the state, we're gonna make it locally. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of different things before we get into some Q&A. So uh, Burlington Tech Center, Burlington High School site search. Um, we, there was a big decision made, a big milestone made on Tuesday. Um, where we narrowed the site search down to three sites. Um, the our real estate consultants who originally had identified 16 possible sites, they immediately eliminated four of them, including two on Pine Street next to the uh, Barge Canal uh, Superfund site. Um, I heard some people were worried about that, so those were off the list. Uh, and then they uh, ranked the 12 remaining sites. Uh, the top two, made the list and those top two are both near the existing site, near the existing campus. So the existing campus is on the north side of what's called Institute Road. Um, and so the top ranked site was actually the north side of Institute Road and it would likely be to the, you're looking at the building from the road would be to the right. So closer to North Avenue. Um, 
The second site is on the south side of Institute Road. So it would likely be where the baseball field is and there's another athletic practice field there. It would not be the stadium and the track and the field would stay, a car stadium would stay. Um, those are the top two. Um, we also identified that uh, there's a high uh, interest for, sorry, I would say overall, the feedback that we heard from, from the community was keep it at the same site. But there was also significant feedback of let's have the high school be downtown. And there are some advantages, obvious advantages to being downtown in connecting with the community. The Institute Road site has some advantages of its beautiful grounds, its access to the lake, um, it's somewhat of a central location, it's got parking, but the central place in this, the high school downtown has some advantage of connecting with the rest of the community, including the, the medical center, UVM, Champlain, uh, and lots of businesses that are downtown. Um, and some of you might have seen that the mayor uh, is campaigning to put a high school down there and also have that project include the renovation of Memorial Auditorium. Uh, there are a lot of questions about putting the high school in that space. A lot of uh, things that our real estate consultants have highlighted. So, um, but we thought it was important to bring forward the, the most attractive downtown site. So those three sites, north side of Institute Road, south side of Institute Road, and the Gateway Block, those will go on to the next phase of, of review. And we're gonna go a little, the consultant's gonna go deeper and start looking at uh, the, the more level of detail into things like what's, what's, uh, what's on the ground, can we build on it, all this level of detail. And uh, we're looking to make a decision to get down to one final candidate in November. So we're really moving forward because one of the things that we, the board and the superintendent agree on is Burlington has a habit of making, taking a long time to consider our decisions and get a lot of feedback, but our students and our community really need a whole long high school. My daughters are going to graduate from downtown DHS. Not going to impact me, but for us to attract families in the future and for families that are coming up through the elementary schools, the middle schools now, it's really important to have a real, a real high school. So we don't want to take eight years to get to a high school. All right, um, real quickly, uh, pupil waiting. So there is, uh, this is education financing in Vermont. So if you're tired, this is just gonna be a snooze fest. Um, to try and not, to try and simplify it, Burlington, Winooski, and a number of other school boards across the state are trying to push the legislature to fix a funding formula that is out of date and that doesn't give appropriate resources to the students that need them the most. Students in poverty, English language learners, students in rural districts, those types of students. And we consider this an equity issue. And we feel that, and, and there was a report done by the legislature, uh, a, a commission by the legislature that, that lays this out pretty plain. The legislature has a task force that is looking at how, what to do with the report's recommendations, and they are straying from those reports' recommendations and looking at other ways to do that. Uh, the Berlin School Board is, is pushing hard. We've given a lot of testimony. We're working behind the scenes. Uh, this is, could be a big, um, big deal for Burlington in terms of in, in, in expanding our programs for our most needy students. So we're working behind the scenes on that. Um, Burlington School District Strategic Plan. So we have a strategic plan that's five years old that was built um, under uh, Superintendent Obed, and it's now five years old and was supposed to last five years. And so we're uh, working, or actually Superintendent Planning is actually leading the effort to create a new strategic plan. Uh, he's got some working groups, I think there's a name for them, a coalition I think is what they're called, of volunteers from staff 
and students and the community. Uh, they're getting some training now and they're going to engage the rest of the community in a process. Um, and we're looking to come out with a five-year strategic plan by the end of the year. And that will give us some, some goals, some strategic goals that we're going to try and hit over five years. So for me, the big difference in the old strategic plan to the, to the one that's coming up, the new one we're going to have uh, indicators that are going to be measured so that we know, are we achieving what we said we're going to achieve? Um, and, that's, and that will be, of course, shared with you. Um, all right, we're like two minutes early, okay. So we ran through that stuff pretty quickly. Why don't we open it up for Q&A? Nate, can you facilitate? Is that possible? I don't know if I can see everybody. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can definitely facilitate, Mike, and, and thanks for the update. Um, so we will move to Q&A. I see one hand in person. So why don't we start it there? So Tiff? Yeah, thanks so much for these reports. Um, I'm just wondering what you, um, <clears throat> what, there is another public hearing that I believe has not been scheduled yet, correct? Uh, around, so the people waiting? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. so there's, there's another opportunity for public comment, I think it's October 12th. Okay, um, I think, and, and, are, would you like to encourage people to speak to the issue? So we uh, probably, it's going to be my answer, we just had an initial conversation, you know, this coalition of school board, we had a conversation today about tactics, what we yeah. want to do uh, about tactics. So I, I think my answer is probably, but when we, we're going to be very, we're going to try to be very specific about what kind of voices we want to bring to that to that comment. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Thanks. Mike, along Thank those same lines, um, a point that may still be a, a point of understanding, misunderstanding is is in the new um, the new concept of a formula is income income sen sensitivity still uh, something that will be part of the, the updated formula. Uh, it is. So the simple answer is income sensitivity will not be impacted by this. This, the recommendation from the study simply has to do with how students are weighted. So there's something called an equalized pupil count. So somebody who's got, who's an English language learner, there's more resources to educate that, that student than there's somebody who, who understands English. So that person gets a weighting so what we're talking about is what should that weight be? Should they be counted as 1.2, 1.3? Um, and the weights that we're using are 20 years old, and apparently there was no real scientific or academic basis for them. So it was a political decision. So what, what the, the study and this work is, is adjusting the weights based on what's known academically, what other states do, uh, and what we're advocating for is nothing about the system changes except what those weights are. That's great. I think I think it's important in, in really the advertising of when things finally sugar it out this coming year, and if the change goes into effect for this year, that people understand exactly how their taxes are valued. Because there are times where folks who don't have students in the school system see it as the school system is being pit against, pitted against citizens who don't have kids in schools. And so I think knowing where things stand in terms of what you're paying for it and how, and it, especially when it comes to income sensitivity, that's a really important thing to be advertised. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you both. Uh, the next hand I saw was from uh, Billy, Gal Billy Clark, another MPA hearing committee member. So, so Billy, you can unmute yourself and then uh, Next up in the stack, we have Amanda, and then um, followed by that, and Fred, did you mind? Yeah. So we'll, we'll have Billy, and then Amanda, and then Fred. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. Uh, and, and thank you, Mike, for the, all your discussions on this. I, I, I have a couple of questions on the um, new high school uh, site. So first, I just wanted to check. Merger is, is off the table now, right? I know that was something that was at least vaguely discussed and exploring when you ski or South Burlington, since you know, at least South Burlington has major high school projects, but I'm assuming that's off the table at this point. Um, 
I know that that's been brought up by a number of people and there have been some reaching out, but um, nothing has progressed to any level of feasibility. Okay, no, that's helpful, thank you. Um, and then as to the sites, um, you know, I, I just, that is more of a comment than a question. I, I, I'm somebody who's really pro the gateway block site. Um, I think it's an amazing opportunity to invest in a public space and public building that is very, very likely to be left to rot otherwise, just given, as you sort of commented on, the, the state of inertia that can happen in Burlington. Um, so I think it's a, a really lively way to have a downtown high school and save what should be a, an amazing public space. Um, and that I worry will not be saved unless we can get behind on this public project. And I guess a final comment slash question, mostly I guess just comment, would be that um, as to like wanting to get the quickest, you know, getting through this process quickly, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I just hope that we give sufficient time to do the analysis of the environmental concerns of doing it in Institute Road, the environmental concerns of doing it in the Gateway, the, you know, logistics of that because I do worry that just focusing on the quickest may you know and rushing is too much it may likely lead to Institute Road which you know is, is totally fine and I, I understand the advantages of the, the advantages there I just I, I really do feel like the gateway block presents an amazing opportunity that's been it's been on the you know discussion boards for a long long time and this just strikes me as such a good fit um, in a lot of ways but I, I, I really I'm really glad to hear this move forward and I really appreciate all the work and you know the superintendent's statement on it was great and all of your guys' work is great, but those are just my sort of comments. Um, I, I appreciate that, Billy, and, and you're not the only one to say that. Uh, someone said this is a generational, once in one or two generational decisions, and we should make the best decision. Um, and it's not about the quickest. And if the, the best location is downtown, and it does take an extra year, it, it's not just about the kids that are going to be at downtown BHS for next year, it's the kids that are going to be in that building for 50, 70, 100 years. So I do appreciate that, that, that viewpoint. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing, Billy. And uh, next up was Amanda. And then after that, uh, we have Fred and then Ed. What was, what was your name? Alex. And then we had Alex. Um, if you'd like to join the stack, just let me know. Either raise your hand on Zoom or raise your hand in uh, not Zoom land. So Amanda, the floor is yours. Just uh, so I haven't really taken a, a deep dive on the waiting issue yet. I did a, a bit of reading, but can you just briefly explain how how the waiting process will or will not change? Uh, funding for for students with with developmental disabilities. I, I worked with that population, and I I know that there are some districts that have significant numbers of students with uh, developmental disabilities um, that that do need a lot of resources. Um, and uh, it's not to take away from students in rural communities; uh, they obviously need considerable resources and, and students that are ESL. Um, but I'm just I, I haven't seen a lot of information on, about how it changes the, the, the waiting for, for students with disabilities. It's a great question, Amanda. And the reason why you haven't heard it is because students with the funding for students with disability is not part of the current waiting formula. Well, how that, uh, and there's a change that's happened uh, when it comes to students with, with special needs. So in, in the past, there's been uh, a complicated way to provide funding where the district has to say, this is what we spent, and then they have to submit it and say, okay, here's what we spent, and then they get reimbursed. And it's a ton of paperwork. And I'm sure Joe is unfortunately very familiar with that load, <laughs> that administrative load. 53%. It's yeah. What's that? The, the number that we get reimbursed on, which is it, the, the formula can you can spend hours looking at, at a single bill. So at seventy three or one seventy three, one of those, something seventy three. Uh, that was done a year or two ago, and it's going to change the way that special needs is funded from a reimbursement model to a 
uh, I think they call it a block grant or census grant. So your districts will get compensated for the number of uh, special needs kids they have and what kind of needs they have. And so that the school district doesn't have to say, here's how we spent the money. They get the money and they're making the decisions that are right for their students. That mechanism is separate from the weighting uh, formula. So that's why you haven't heard uh, around the special needs kids when we're talking about the, the, the pupil weight. And sorry, do you estimate that that, that will actually potentially open up more money or, or will it reduce, like if it comes through, through grant funding, and my understanding is if in, in my experience, grants have a, a cap on the amount uh, usually, like w what funding is there? Does, does will that impact um, or, or diminish what what districts have to, to use for those students? Uh, it's a complicated answer because the the, the system that they're that they're moving to is not settled yet. But from what from what I hear from our administrators is it will help Burlington because number one is going to reduce that administrative burden. So how many hours are spent? by our student support services team doing the paperwork. Much better to have them providing the services directly to the students. So right there, that administrative burden is gonna help Burlington. Uh, whether we're gonna get more cash or actual funding, I don't know if that's been, um, if we figured that out yet. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. and. Uh... So next up we had Fred, and so I'm gonna take this opportunity right now too. Um, if uh, our, for our next presenter, Kevin Pounds, if I, I don't see your name in the participant list, but if you could raise your hand if you are here, um, that'll, that'll kinda of, you know, give us a sense of what we have for timing. I uh, definitely wanna make sure we get in anybody, any comments. So um, yeah, Kevin, if you're here, if you could just raise your hand on Zoom. Oh, so he may have actually just walked in. So, uh, uh, <laughs> perfect timing. I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to crash the party. <laughs> so, so we we have two more uh, questions here, and then we'll move over to Kevin. So. So we'll start with Fred. And I we'll think uh, Alex. two quick data questions. Is there any data on how many kids dropped out, went to private school, or took another alternative over the two years? Uh, I heard the number was less than 25. From, from the, you're talking about from DHS? Yeah, yeah. So I heard the number was net, the net number, the net decrease was, was less than 25. So wow. There's probably more than 25 left, but we did have new students coming. That's great. The second question, I saw a release from Leahy's office about two weeks ago that said he'd identified 64 school buildings in Vermont that had similar PBS issues. Is Has anybody seen any more information about that? Uh, there is a uh, bill, I think this, I think the governor signed to, so, so just taking a step back, the thing that's scary for Berlin, for Vermont districts and the legislature is if you look for PCBs, you're going to find them. Mm -hmm. right. uh, are, are, is it going to be as bad as Burlington? Not always. So like Champlain Elementary had a, a scan done and they found PCBs and, uh, that were over the level and, and just in like, I think, two rooms and they fixed them. Uh, Winooski is redoing a renovation and they had some PCBs were able to to fix them. But you're going to find them in the buildings, especially from the 50s and 60s and 50s and 70s. Yeah. So there's a hesitancy to do a ton of testing because once you find them, like us, you have to fix them. Uh, or you have to get the kids and the students out of the building if they're bad. So there was a bill, and Tim, maybe you can help me if you're aware, there was a yeah. bill to essentially stand up like a program to figure out what to do. Yeah, it's a construction, school construction bill that first has to do an assessment of what is actually, um, what the construction costs are likely to be, what schools need um, uh, renovation or repairs, and um, that's, uh, that's a, <clears throat> their uh, school funding for school construction from the state has been halted 
And so um, the next step in the process would be once we knew what the universe of funding that's needed is, then um, the legislature would uh, appropriate funding um, for that construction. But I think there's a lot of concern about PCBs um, in many, many of our schools. And I'd heard today two public buildings. Apparently there yes. were a lot of public buildings built in the 60s. Just quickly, Mike, yeah, don't, don't give up. I, the last thing in the world I thought was that we'd have another kid at BHS, but my grandson came up from Maryland this year and went to BHS and had a fantastic year. The curriculum offered him uh, opportunities that he would not have gotten in Maryland. So, uh, and now he's college bound, which was not a plan of his when he came up here. So. That's great to hear, and, and thank you for that. And and I will say I heard from one of my uh, daughter's teachers that his classroom that he's happier at downtown BHS than he was in the old building because when it rains, it doesn't leak into his. <laughs> oh my God! So, so downtown BHS has a lot of challenges. There's not a good gym. There's not a kitchen. It's not as big as. Right, there are challenges, but the kids and the and the teachers in the community are really doing great work in that building. Thanks for those questions, Fred. And and we'll pass it over. Uh, before I pass it over, to Alex, um, I want to just introduce also. Uh, we had another presenter in that, uh, Tip Bloomley. Representative for uh, Chinden 65. Yep. Yep. Um, so, oh, 118 seconds to shut down. Uh oh. This is the new technology. We suddenly <laughs> cut it to So, I'll uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well done. Well done. Um, <laughs> Catch. Everybody who's not in the room, we just had a, a doom clock. So, uh, <laughs> thankfully, great. Uh, so, Alex, uh, here's the last comments on that on this session, so the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, yeah, regarding the site of the new high school, uh, without knowing, I guess, the sort of geographic distribution of the students, I might assume that a high school downtown would be more accessible from the perspective of people being able to walk or bike to the high school. And I'm wondering if there's any trade-offs to be considered there, whether it's concrete things like attendance or I guess more squishy things like the psychological independence of the students being able to, you know, get themselves to and from school at a younger age and things like that. No, it's absolutely, that's one of the factors there are, I forget how many factors there were in, in ranking all of the, all of the sites and uh, transportation and environmental impact of transportation was definitely a factor, right, that you've got bus lines coming in to downtown. So it's not just you know students from the core or from the old North End, but that there's an opportunity for for people from around like the South End or the, the new North End. So that's absolutely a factor out. It's just one of a number of them. Uh, for example, and I don't want to end on a downer, but uh, someone reminded me that for the history buffs, there was the old ravine. And if you don't know about the ravine, go go do some looking. But this is where the old Everyone used to dump their trash in like the 1700s and 1800s. That goes, and it's been filled in, that goes underneath the gateway block. Mm -hmm. right? So there's all sorts of scary stuff. But it, one of, the, one of the, <laughs> the school administrators the other night said, there's so much we don't know about the gateway block. We actually know what's wrong with Institute Road. Right? We've done so much testing there. We know where the PCB soil contamination ends, for example, right? So all of these factors, we want to take all of them together. Transportation, um, the, the, the ability to connect with the community downtown, all of that, and I'll add that all up and, and try and get it down to one. But, but definitely transportation is a huge thing um, for downtown, and that's also environmental right more kids that are biking and walking is less um, uh, motors that that go out to, to north end well, all right well on that note uh thank you mike thank you joe um you know we always appreciate uh hearing what's going on with the school and especially there's been a lot of news going on so we always appreciate uh this opportunity for for folks to be able to ask questions directly to you um, and I'm sure we will see you in a future MPA.
hopefully uh, it won't even be hybrid. Maybe it'll just be, you know, I mean, hybrid's pretty good. Hybrid's pretty accessible, but it's it is nice to have this opportunity to see folks in person. So uh, if, yeah. if, if anybody has any yeah. questions, what, what would be the best way to, to get in, in touch with you? Should they be watching this at a later date? Uh, you can email me at mb, as in boy, Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R, at bsdbt.org. I'll put that in the chat. And, uh, and I'll definitely take a look at the uh, front porch forum I'm posting there. Uh, recently seems like weekly. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much, and uh, have a good rest of your night. And, and with that note, we will uh, pass it over to Kevin Bounds, who is the director of A New Place, who is the uh, who runs the Champlain Inn. Um, and before Kevin goes, I just want to give a quick shout out again. Kristen Wilson, the, the MBA specialist, um, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a lift to, to make this hybrid uh, model work citywide, and, and she's had a lot on her shoulders. So, you know, just definitely kudos again. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. So without much further ado, here is uh, Kevin. Hi. Thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Pounds. Uh, I'm executive director of A New Place, and I want to say thank you to Kristen and Nathan, I'm not sure who else was on the email list, but thanks for inviting me um, to share at the meeting. And also, uh, I think there's probably some neighbors on this that I've talked to, whether on the phone or via email. And um, believe it or not, I actually do appreciate neighbors reaching out directly with questions and concerns. Um, it's, um, it's really tough to offend me on a personal level, unless you're making fun of my mom. So, um, and you don't know my mom, so we're safe. Um, yeah, um, we... Uh, we're obviously a homeless service agency in Burlington. We oversee three facilities, um, one of which is the Champlain Inn, uh, which we began operating in December. Um, and I'm just gonna hit some high notes and just didn't leave lots of space for questions. Um, we typically, uh, and, and even though in the beginning our goal was to operate with 50 guests on site, we typically operate with about 60. That's the number we're hitting regularly now. Um, 40 of those are in what we call permanent beds. And what that means simply is like, once somebody's in a bed, it is their bed every night until they either choose to move on or they get dismissed for some reason. Um, we have 10 what we, could, what we call walk-in beds. And that means it's a first come, first serve every night. Like you show up, um, we open those up right at around 7.30 and it's um, first come, first serve. We have 10 of those. We typically have 20 something people show up. And so we have, that's the reason our numbers have eked up a little bit is for obvious reasons. We prefer um, not turning people away because it generally means they're gonna head to the park to sleep. I mean, that's, that, that's what's gonna happen. And so we, we kind of, I like to be honest about what happens if, if we turn people away. And so uh, even with us up in the number, we're still turning away five to 10 people each evening. Uh, most of our guests have to check out in the morning at 8 a.m. They check back in at 6 p.m. That's the permanent beds, walk-ins. And there's, there's a reason we don't do walk-ins until later is we need to actually see how many people we have on site before we start letting walk-ins check in. There are four people right now who have what we call reasonable accommodations that can stay 24 seven. And so they have a disability or health reason. Um, over the next month, we're looking at expanding that to 10. Um, people ask all the time, why do you cap it at four? Is it because that's how many, I mean, it really comes down to staffing, it really does. And, and, and I'll just say that the people we have with reasonable accommodations in a perfect world, most of them would be in a place with nursing care to be quite honest. I mean, we're, we're a lot of times, the people we're providing reasonable accommodations to um, would not be people staying, that we would have seen in a shelter maybe a few years ago, right? It's just, it's just services are maxed out right now. Um, we also, uh, beginning November 15th through April 15th in the cold weather months, we are gonna be opening our common space. So that means like, even if people have to check out at eight o'clock, they can still access, like we, we have two living rooms in the house that they'll be able to access during the day there. Um, I think it, just some general statements about just homelessness in Burlington and Vermont. I think uh, us, like a lot of homeless services agency and the people that works for um, Howard Center doing street outreach, 
Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. They have a street outreach team. I think it is safe to say we're all kind of collectively feeling this, this stretch right now. And I think that part of that is just because um, a lot of us are just kind of maxed out space-wise. We're maxed out um, staffing-wise. And, and we're, at, we're, we're always looking to grow that. But um, it's just very difficult to grow at the rate of what's happening. And I think you can just kind of eyeball it around Burlington without even knowing the numbers. You know, like I try a few times a week to do a walk between where I work and I live um, right on the edge of the between the old north and the new north and at Cambrian near, across the street from Cambrian Rise. And so like my my weekly walks, you know, I kind of zigzag back and forth between like um, I see Sears Lane, I see all the, the parks, it's some green spaces, and it's just you eyeballing, you can see that there's more people that are camping, sleeping in parks, stuff like that. And I think another reason we're just feeling the stretch too is I think it's, it's, if it's not common knowledge, it's gonna be common knowledge, that there's another 600 people that are gonna be um, losing their general assistance support in, in another week. So actually September 23rd, so it's next week. And there's, there's gonna be 600 people statewide exiting onto the streets. And so um, I figure, and, and I don't know how many of those will end up finding another place, but I think it's safe to say that many of them are gonna to migrate to population centers. We're obviously the big population center in the state. So we're kind of anticipating that whether that's 50 people, 100 people, whatever it is, that we're gonna see an influx you know, uh, of that and just trying to figure out, okay, what do we do with that? Um, because you know, it's, as I have talked to different people um, in leadership in different, you know, different roles, it doesn't really matter if it's five more people or 10 more people or 20 more people. If the shelters are at capacity, that means that whatever that number is, they're on the street, especially now that they're being, that we know motels are not an option for them. So we're, we're filling that stretch. Um, also, I also wanna to say too, um, just because I, I have the mic for a second, is I don't think there's anybody that works for a new place that thinks more shelters is the long-term ideal or the long-term solution. Um, I mean, I, I, I love my job, but, it, but our growth is not something like, it's not something I don't wake up in the morning. I mean, I'm thankful for the people we get to serve, but I'm not pleased that we have to increase capacity. I'm really not. It's like, I know that long-term affordable housing with support services is the solution. And so I, I beat that drum every chance I get is like, you know, it, it's that, a lot of times people are going to ask me, is like, where do people go from the Champlain Inn? Or where do they go from your sober shelter? And right now the answer is nowhere. Um, a, good, a good example would be even, because we have about 16 people right now that are, like, that are in a special program where they're maintaining sobriety, 80% uh, of them are employed. Pre-pandemic, they would stay with us three months, maximum nine months. Many of those people are waiting over a year to get into housing. And so, I mean, I think that gives you kind of an idea of like how, it's, how much the landscape has changed kind of, I, I wanna say post pandemic, but I, you know, what, what, whatever we're in right now. So um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm also, any questions I'm more than willing to answer. Yeah, I'll, uh, with that, th thank you so much for sharing, Kevin, and, and we'll open it up to questions. Um, I saw one hand in person already, but um, again, if, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand either in person or, or via Zoom and, and we'll uh, add you onto the stack. But um, seeing none immediately other than, than Andy, we'll, we'll start with Andy. Hi, Kevin. Um, my name is Andy Simon. Mm -hmm. I um, uh, thank you very much for the work that you do. I know it's incredibly crucial and I know it's hard. I, with my partner Ruby Perry, I'm we're uh, coordinators of the community garden in Callahan Park, mm -hmm. um, and we have been uh, sort of playing phone tag with you about um, uh, talking and just discussing the situation in the park as it relates to to Champlain Inn. Mm -hmm. um, there's been an incredibly fruitful discussion among the the 20 families or so that are. Gar gardening in the in the community garden mm -hmm. about the situation uh, in the park as it relates to the garden. Um, 
there's been a really lively discussion both in person and on email about sort of, okay, what is our responsibility? Mm -hmm. And what are the impacts individually uh, uh, to the gardeners? Uh, how, how do we relate to the, the presence of a lot of unhoused people in the park who are often hanging out right next to the garden, smoking, right. you know, talking loud, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the biggest question that keeps coming up is uh, um, sort of what, trying to understand what options there are for people besides just hanging out in the park. Mm -hmm. You know, during the day when they have to leave the shelter, uh, what what options there are, and um, especially for people who are um, uh, wouldn't sort of uh, are below uh, below or above a sobriety uh, level that would be acceptable, say at the library or at other at other shelters. So maybe you could just talk about that just for the general. Uh, edification of people to sort of understand what what happens for people during the day for for people at Champlain Inn, for instance. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges to what you're saying is very few places. I mean, and I'll, I'll say this: if somebody is is stumbling drunk, um, we have issues with them coming into our common space too. You know, but just so I think that that creates. You know, even though there's a lot of options around town, and I'd say a lot. That's probably there. There are several options. Um, which include, you know, for um, somebody pursuing sobriety, which some of our guests are, Turning Point Center. I mean, and, and, and Turning Point Center we work closely with. So there are some of our guests that go there. Day Station, Cost Day Station is another popular place. And as you say, the library is also open. But again, if you're like heavily intoxicated, that's not going to be a, pl a place for you to go. So it is, it is limited options, but um, those are kind of the three go-tos is the library day station and day station is by far you know the the I would say the most frequented of the three I just mentioned and just because it's um I mean there's not like a strict sobriety test there it's more about it's more behavioral um, I think that you know during um, we did do a test run for a few days during like the 90 degree weather just to see if people would, you know, and, and given 90 degree weather is different than 10 degree weather, right? How people respond to that. You just wanted to see if like, if, if we would have a majority of people show up and stay in our common space, if we opened it up and, you know, and, and those are pretty simple. I mean, we have a TV in there, it's air conditioned, you know, water, some simple snacks, nothing complex. And I mean, we had maybe six or seven people utilize it. And so, so we realized that opening common space was not going to, I, I thought maybe that would draw people in, but it did not. So I, I, that's not that's not really a great answer as much as just saying like that's kind of what the landscape is and options are for people. I do think it. I do think on the cold weather, we will have people utilize our common space more. I mean, I think that's just going to that 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 always is a callus for people coming inside. Thank you both. Thank you, Andy, for the question and, and Kevin for the for the response. It looks like we have another question from Amanda. Uh, Amanda, you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Thanks. I, I have to admit that when you were first starting up, I was a little bit nervous because it, it, it happened very suddenly. And I, I, I was nervous about the, the prospect of, of, even though it, it was, it's important and valuable, I, I was nervous about how this was going to affect things. Uh, I live right down the street from you, and I think you guys do a really good job. And I, I'm happy that people have a, a place to go irrespective of, uh, of their sobriety. Um, but can you just explain a little bit like, about why they can't? And I'm not saying that they, they, they should have to, uh, that anyone should have to, to uh, like, not, not I, I, they're our neighbors, and like they, they're they're welcome to, to any space. But my father was in house for a little while, and I, I just think about would wouldn't it be very natural to to want to if you have a bed there, it's a permanent bed, to be able to stay during the day if you wanted to stay in your room because it's your room, and. I don't know how the, I know that the motels before, uh, since I've lived here for five years, they, they've always been used to some degree just with, with 
fewer, I think there were fewer beds that were dedicated to, to this usage, and there were less social services there. But it, was that a shift in the past? Were people able to use their, their room as though it was their room? Um, so, I mean, if you're speaking, speaking about the Champlain Inn's history before us purchasing it, I mean, it was a kind of, I mean, I guess you could call it, it was an extended stay motel that was functioning beyond that. But, you know, that's, you know, but yeah, I mean, people were staying there for a very long time, you know, for some cases, you know, months or years. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was functioning very differently before we took it over. Um, I, I would say historically, uh, we took over um, running the low barrier shelter for the city and the, I guess it was November of 2019. And historically, it had been just overnight and run November 15th through April, or, you know, November to April, right? And sometimes it would eke into, into May a little bit. And so for us, we thought like the big step was like figuring out how to make it year round, figuring out how to like, okay, create some some more space for you know reasonable accommodations i think it, i think everybody knows what that term means by now you know it's like for people with disabilities and health issues um but and, and, I, and i'm sharing personal perspective there are definitely agencies that have a different opinion than i do on this but i do think one lesson that was learned from the from 2000 being people being in motels is that people staying in their motel rooms for days at a time um that may be struggling with mental health challenges and substance use challenges, it looks really good on the COVID tracker and really bad on every other tracker of metrics in their lives, right? Like the thing that doesn't make the press is like how many ODs happened, right? Or how many Narcan, you know, Narcan incidents happened per day. And I can just say that like it's given, I think, I think it's hard to um, have good metrics like during a pandemic and you know and so there's been all kinds of factors since the spring like you know obviously it's 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 you know summer and so people function better during the summer but i'll just say that our incidents as far as um have decreased when people have motion outside of their room even if it's just like and it increases the chances significantly that even if it's just a portion of the guest, right? It increases the, the, the chances significantly that because they're having to like have motion during the day, that they're gonna go to the safe harbor clinic and show up for their appointment, right? Or that they're gonna go to the turning point and meet with their coach, or they're gonna go to, if that makes sense, right? It, it does increase that. Um, unfortunately, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, a plus and minus on that. And, I think I could speak for our shelter coordinator. Heather does a good job of, of uh, explaining this sometimes better than I do, is we want to create a safe, supportive environment for people, but we don't, we don't want it to feel like home. We actually do want there to be a little bit of discomfort so there's forward motion in people's lives. You, you explained that really well, and I thought about that too. That sometimes being being holed up in the same space, um, even with with mental health issues, can can be detrimental. It's just I given that that we're I just I, I, I worry about what you just were talking about before. That given that there's very little to move forward to in terms of housing, getting out. Yeah. I, I, I would love for them to feel like like they own something, um, but uh, you, that's not to say you're doing an amazing job. So it's it's not a slight. No, uh, no, I, I don't. I just saying, I don't feel that as a slight. It's a tension. I mean, if it's probably won't make you feel better, but it's a tension we feel too. You know, because it is. You know, it's it's. Um, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I'll just say like sometimes. I mean, a term we use sometimes is creating false bottoms for people, right? It's like it's like where they need something, and so like if if by yeah, sometimes you you, you create a situation where it actually seems like it's helping them, but it's not. It's actually preventing them from taking steps on their own. And 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 I would say that a lot of 
this is definitely an increase is 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 that we really want like we can't force our guests to access services but um part of part of the reason of even opening the common space during the winter period right is like bringing services into that right so like that it's it's kind of creating a, a space where okay you're in here and here's the safe harbor clinic nurses right you know you're in here and look there's a turning point you know recovery coach you know in our offices right so it kind of there there is some method to the madness there well seeing no other hands and and looking at the time um i think that uh that seems like a good spot to, to stop for the evening. And, and thank you so much, Kevin, for, thank you. for presenting and sharing a lot of information. Um, you know, as someone who works in housing and works with the homeless community, and, and, you know, I definitely empathize with the idea of I love my job, but I wish I would rather not have to do it. Yeah. Um, so if folks have any other questions, what's, what's the best way to get in contact with you? I, th I think uh, probably the, the most straightforward way is just sending me an email. Um, it's. Uh, it's just my first initial K pounds at a new place vt.org. And I have put that in the chat. Oh, <laughs> Sherston did too. We both were on it. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, all right. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank and, you, um, you know, it, it's great to have you, and, and I'm sure that the conversation will continue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Right. Thank you. And with that, we uh, move on to our last agenda item, which is with. Uh, Martha Keenan, who is in the clerks and treasurer's office. Martha, is, you know, sorry to, to have you start a little bit later than in the anticipated time, but you know, thanks so much for, for sticking around, and thanks everybody else for, for sticking around. Um, and with that, the floor is yours, Martha. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your letting me come tonight, and I, I found the last two conversations fascinating. Um, I've been going to all of the NPAs, and it is just um, great to hear the various conversations that you all have. Um, I work, I am a capital and special projects director. I work in the clerk treasurer's office. Um, I am a flatlander who went to UVM and married a Vermonter, and I've been here ever, ever since. And pretty much, um, I have worked in Burlington almost all of my career, which is almost 40 years. Um, so I uh, started on the career of doing capital type things. Uh, I helped renovate Lawson Lane and the Deacon McKenzie buildings. So the Hague building is where Bone is um, on the waterfront, and the McKenzie building is the one next to it that um, houses gentlemen's top option. So I've been doing construction all of these years and um, using it also with uh, finance. So I started with the city and public works um, eight years ago. And um, I'm going to give you a nice little uh, slideshow on the capital plan. It was pretty much the first large project that I was given. I started in January of 2014. And the story of the capital plan started in March of 2014. So um, we are hoping to help you understand the, what the capital plan is and the infrastructure and the overall needs. And the end goal is that you understand it and have an opinion that when we go to a special election, our hope is to have a special election in December where there will be a, a vote before you regarding a bond to help continue um, attending to the needs of the capital plan. So that's our goal, is to help you understand what that need is and answer any questions of how it impacts you. And I really liked the notes that you all gave on how to start this, because that is a really nice way to do it. It's, I haven't had that in any of the other NPAs that I went to, so thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen, unless anybody has any comments before I even get into it. No. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, this is um, continuing the Burlington Capital Plan, infrastructure plan. 
the history of it is, as I said, is that in March 2018, the mayor in his state of the city said that he was going to create a capital plan and would present it the following year. And indeed, um, we did present our first drafts that next year, uh, but it took us until September of 2016 to actually have the capital plan, a 10-year capital plan, that we were able to bring to the city council and they approved it. Um, and uh, with that approval, it uh, was the request to go to the voters for a bond in November of that year, which we did in November and we were successful for $27.5 million. And it was, uh, we need 66 and two thirds percent and we got 78%, so we had a really strong showing that the public believed that we had this need. That was to cover our first five years. So 2021 finished the first five years of the capital plan. And what did we do? We worked with all the city departments, the public city council to reinvest in the overall city infrastructure. It's what makes the city vibrant. So we touched everything, the greenway, the bike path, sidewalks, roads, renovating a lot of buildings um, and every project considers how we can move towards our city's net zero energy goal. Uh, one of the other areas is in fleet and um, we have been electrifying our, our vehicles as we move along as well. So what have we accomplished? Um, we've improved over 14 miles of sidewalks. Prior to the capital plan we were doing one mile a year, we're now doing three miles a year and uh, when we were only doing one mile a year, we have over 100 miles of sidewalks. So that meant that a sidewalk was re being, being replaced once every 100 years, which isn't really what you call a good turnaround. The average is more 40 years. So we are moving in that direction. That's what we're trying to do is create a sustainable level of reinvestment in our capital. We doubled our street, so we're trying to do five miles, four to five miles of street every year. We have rehabilitated seven miles of the bike path, 90%. At the end of this year, the only part that will be left to complete that uh, renovation is the North Beach Overpass Bridge, which has to be replaced. Um, we created a new parks facility in Letty Park so we moved the grounds and trees uh, divisions of parks to their own building so that they have their own space and can keep their equipment there. And it has helped them be much more efficient and uh, use less labor because they're more uh, organized in one area. Um, it also, uh, we put in diesel tanks um, in Letty at the same time. Previously, the all of the fleet that was out there had to go to 645 to gas up. And so if you have a snowstorm and somebody's in the north end and they're plowing in the north end and they need to get gas, they would have to drive all the way back to 645 Pine, which could take a half an hour, drive back and then continue their route. Now they can fill up in Letty and keep doing their work. It means that our fire trucks don't have to go out of service in order to fill up, which they were doing previously. So it helps all the way around in efficiency. It helps our streets because they actually get used less and uh, we use less fuel that way. We've improved a lot of our building envelopes, um, insulation, new roofs, new HVAC systems. Um, doing all this improves the efficiencies and our, and our energy efficiency in them and reduces costs. We improved our IT infrastructure. Um, Originally, there was $125,000 a year was all that was spent on IT. And over the last year, you all can know how hard it was with technology. Tonight, you have this really nice, neat new TV that's at 645 Pine that you're looking through. And um, that's one of the things that we're investing in. Is so we're getting those in most of the major conference rooms that do a lot of public meetings so that we can continue to have hybrid meetings in the future. We did a lot of security improvements, uh, electronic door systems and our video system. We brought the video system all in-house to one um, system and it is housed in dispatch police department. 
So if someone has to respond to an event, uh, the dispatcher can pull up the cameras and help whoever is responding know what's going on before they get there. So that helps them walk into a situation with eyes already on it. So they are um, can be better prepared for whatever it is. Um, we have created three new committees that are really important to making the capital plan work. We created um, first capital committee. Originally when we started, I was the only one doing capital and I was the one saying yes or no to a project. That's not a really comfortable spot to be in. We created a committee that is made up of uh, all of the major departments. So CEDO, Public Works, Parks, and the uh, Clerk Treasurer's Office, um, along with CEDO, are all together. And uh, that helps us create a better uh, process and ensures uh, equity across the board. Um, we also set up a fleet committee. And um, previously, each department bought their own vehicles and there was no real collaboration or system. Now it's all in one place. We created a financial strategy that uses both master leases and bonding to return over our vehicles in a timely manner. And prior to 2016, we had had four years where we replaced no vehicles. They have 350 vehicles. So of those vehicles, they just got older and harder and to do anything with. In the last five years, we've replaced 28% of our vehicles. And we want to keep doing that. As we return, as we turn them over, we actually have more equity in them. So when we turn them in, we're getting more money back for them. And that helps. Um, and they have less maintenance. So we're spending less time maintaining the vehicles as we go forward. What did we learn? That the capital needs are evolving. We've had a lot of different weather events that have affected the city. And that um, although the capital plan is a picture in time, when you look at it, it's a spreadsheet and you have your needs for one day, it actually changes every single day. Because we have a rainstorm, we get two inches of rain, and a roof fails, or you create a new pothole, or you get flooding in one of the basements. So. It, it creates a capital project right then and there. And that goes on all the time. We also um, have a better understanding of our assets and what their deficiencies are. Uh, the other committee I forgot to mention is our asset management committee. And we are in the process of implementing our own asset management platform where all of these assets are in one place and we can record their condition and help us prioritize when we need to um, replace it rather than just saying it's 20 years old, it needs to be replaced. Um, we have decades of, of deferred maintenance to catch up on, and it's going to take us decades to get there. This is not a one-time deal. It is an ongoing deal for forever. It's always We're always going to have potholes, and they're always going to have to be fixed. Um, we have a better understanding of all the competing needs, and that helps us prioritize better. Uh, when we did budget process this year, uh, there was a survey that was sent out, and the uh, it showed that the public strongly supported the infrastructure for the city. Um, over the next three years, which is what we're looking at, we have a, a need of over $140 million. Um, and it's not just going to come from one place. There are a lot of potential funding sources right now, which is, it's an opportunity in front of us that is really awesome. We have the federal infrastructure bill. It's the first time it's come, we've had federal help of that sort in, in decades. There's the American Rescue Plan, and then the state has a lot of new programs as well from money that they've received. And so we have a lot of opportunities in front of us that we're looking at. But even with those opportunities, we still have a need. We have items that can't be covered under those different opportunities. So we're going, we're looking to do a special election. Why? Um, when the pandemic hit, it set all of our planning back a year. We were looking at coming to everyone, the voters, 
last year and it just wasn't the right time and so we're here now um we're coming before town meeting day because it um, would negatively impact our construction season next year most of our planning is done in uh january february and march and we put out rfps then and we award it as early as possible so that we can get the most competitive bids if we were to go on town meeting day we would not be able to have a very good construction season because we would lose out on that timing we can't go out and try and, and put an rfp out if we don't know we have the money to pay for the contract it's not fair to the vendor to make that sort of thing our interest rates right now are really low but there there's questions as whether they're going to stay there so it is a good time to go out financially for it um and we want the community to focus on the high school plans on town meeting day um even with all these other resources that might be there more is needed so we broke down how these different resources um are could be used now uh for the infrastructure bill we and grants we have to apply for them so it's our hope that we can, are going to be competitive and can get these things but we have streets we have street capital tax that covers a lot of it we have a traffic division that can make a contribution to it and then when you can see we, we have a, a large amount that we're hoping to get from the federal infrastructure bill and then um, we have a lot of grants that are already existing such as um, the rail yard enterprise and shelter street roundabout which uh, you all see daily uh, we're going to use just a small amount of bond proceeds what we're looking at is for streets sidewalks and bridges that the um, main investment is going to work uh, hoping and working to get through the federal infrastructure bill and only uh, using minimal bond proceeds for those items at this point um, we have a lot of intersection improvements to to do um, and that's going to be a combination of different funding sources um, with the grants that we have we have local matches that are required um, so we are looking to fund some of them through that we also get two million dollars every year for the capital and we would um, address uh, obligate or hold a lot of that for those local matches once you uh, accept a grant you are obligated to the match that goes with it so we have that ob in an obligation going forward um so we have uh, penny for parks as well and then with our vehicles every year we do an annual um, master lease to uh, take the vehicles that have a life of less than 10 years what we're hoping to put into the bond are the fleet vehicles that have a longer life such as fire trucks um, sidewalk tractors uh, plows that type of thing so this is the breakdown of the um, request that we would like to bring the voters uh, in December um, for sidewalks streets IT uh, the intersection improvements, our local matches. Um, we have a lot of bridges in Burlington. We have a few that have an immediate need, um, the North Beach Overpass Bridge, uh, the Rock Point Bridge, uh, the Queen City Bridge, and Winooski Bridge are also all have needs right now. Um, in order to do all this work, we have project management. Our buildings, even though we've made a lot of strides, we still have more to go. Um, we have a lot of historic uh, buildings and they uh, need rehabilitation rather than replacement and that is more expensive. So we have a lot of windows that we need to replace and um, an example, City Hall has 79 windows in it and each window is about $500 a piece to replace to replace so not and that's not even the installation um in the parks parks have penny for parks but they have some larger projects that if they were to use their penny for parks funding on them they wouldn't be able to do any work in the small small projects in all of the parks 
and uh, items such as that is uh, the boathouse. Uh, is not really a park and doesn't come under the Penny for Parks funding. And so it is in need of a replacement of its barge. So it's sinking over time. And um, so that wouldn't, that would be a bond item rather than an item that could be covered by Penny for Park. Um, I spoke a little bit about the fleet and then we have uh, public safety infrastructure. The city has its own radio system for both police and fire with their cell towers, repeaters, um, everything. And it's at end of life and it needs to be replaced. Um, and the price tag is 4.3 million. Um, and lastly is Memorial. Um, we're in a tough spot. Memorial is a historic building. Um, it has been vacant since 2016 just prior to the pandemic, um, we had almost a, an agreement to renovate it with a partner. And that fell through when the, pan when the pandemic hit and, and the building has just continued to uh, go downhill since then. This um, set aside is going to help us determine uh, whether uh, it, it gets rebuilt in a way so that um, $10 million would really only allow it to get upgraded systems. So it has no elevator and it has no ADA access. It has no ventilation system and its boilers are from 1963. So as well as it needs a new fire and sprinkler system. So those are just simple everyday things um, that it needs. We've had structural engineers look at it, and um, it, it's a uh, steel building with masonry around the outside. <coughs> Excuse me, one minute. And water has come through the masonry and rusted the steel. And it's rusted it so much that it's broken the bricks on the outside. So it needs to have uh, the masonry taken off. <laughs> and the steel repaired and some structural work done. We don't know how stable it really is. So the question is, does it get renovated? Does it go to help another entity, such as the school, which is being discussed? Or does it transition and not be memorial anymore? <laughs> and this $10 million will help us with those discussions and decisions, but something has to happen because it just can't sit there any longer. Um, it, it's uh, the uh, boilers themselves are pretty much at end of life. Like they usually live a boiler is 30 years. It's, it's more than double its life. And those boilers would not be used if you picked any other use for the building, you wouldn't use that type of a boiler in, in this day and age. So you can't just replace it when you don't know what you want to do with the building. So that's our $40 million request that we would like to make of the voters. <clears throat> um, we want to be fiscally responsible. And in 2018, the city came up with a debt policy. And so um, it looks at various uh, two main ratios and um, Target on one is 1.75, but the high limit is 2%. And when we get a bond, we don't draw all $40 million at once. We draw it in, in tranches. And so um, it would be drawn over the three years. And as you can see, it gets it up close to that 2%, but it doesn't. And then it starts to go back down and it goes back down again because uh, there is debt that's being retired. And so it actually will decrease that ratio and put us in a good shape. We're, we're really conscious we want to keep our Moody's credit score and we can still do that with this bond and with the school bond. So we did the calculations with the understanding that the school would draw that full 70 million that they have authorized. And so these calculations are taking that into account. Um, um, the other target uh, ratio um, target is 
And on this, you can see that we don't even come close to that. So we are staying fiscally responsible with it. And um, we've been very thoughtful about how we would pull it and what it would do uh, for our credit rating. Of course, how does it affect you, the residents of Burlington? And we, uh, median home right now is $379,000. And uh, with this, you would see that there is a, a slight increase. So from between $7 and $13 a month, um, it would increase it. So um, your high point is in fiscal year 25, where it goes up in that time frame, and then it starts going down again. And that's again, because that debt is being retired. So um, it, it would be a $7 a month to a $13 a month increase for the median home. What are our next steps? Well, we, um, we did meet with the Board of Finance and City Council on this past Monday and presented all of this information to them. They did have some questions and um, we had a great discussion on it. And so we are coming back to them on September 27th and uh, hope that we will get approval from them to be able to put an item on a special meeting ballot in December. I am continuing to meet with commissions and wards all the way through it, um, other committees as well. Um, and hope that I can help people understand what this need is, why we need it, and how it will help keep the city vibrant moving forward. Last schedule. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, we were muted. Muted. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, I'll open the floor to uh, questions now and. Let's see. Um, again, if, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand either in person or, or in the Zoom. And I know it's a lot of information, but, um, but happy to answer. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for kind of breaking down some of the things, especially regarding, you know, what, what the money looks like going towards a memorial um it's it's really great to have a little bit more of a breakdown of of where this is actually going so you know i and, and i'm sure others in attendance really appreciate you presenting it's my pleasure i actually have a lot of fun doing it so <laughs> oh, it sounds like you really know what you're talking about it's it's overwhelming thanks for all your hard work Thank you. Yes, I, you know, I've, this has been pretty much my life for eight years and sort of like the person before me, I love what I do. Will there be any other question on the December ballot if there's a special yes. election? So there is the uh, Burlington Electric will have a revenue bond. So we, um, even if we were not going, they were already going for a special elect uh, meeting in December. I'm wondering whether with the tax hit after the um, reassessment, whether people are going to be skeptical about any ask for um, uh, any money that will increase their taxes. We thought about that. Um, and I would say that you are my fourth board that I've um, talked with. And um, I believe that everybody understands the need and that deferring it only makes the costs higher. And so that um, most people that I have talked with feel that, uh, yes, it will hurt to a degree, but that the alternative would hurt more. I can't, I can't be seen, but I wanted to ask whether um, does someone audit the work that you do? Um, as, I mean, so, I mean, I know, yeah, you could, I, as part, yeah, this is part of the information, but does, but do you have people working, looking at the work, work that you, 
do on, on, on your level or, or, or the state level or the state level and, and they are buying some of them and they are buying what you've been telling us? So um, in the way of having uh, infrastructure bill and other funding sources or in the way of uh, I, I work for the CAO of the city and we work closely with um, the Vermont League of Cities and, and Towns as well as the National League of Cities and Towns and um, because of all of the grants we do we have a lot of relationships with both the state and the federal government um, for the work and they any grant is overseen by them mm -hmm. um, does that answer uh, what you are yeah yeah so they so, so, so they verify so they so they could verify so the only question about about the new information they 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 verify some of this information so they 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 they, they, they verify some of information for themselves right yes Okay, yeah, okay. Um, one thing that the city does have is that they have an auditor that every year looks at the work that's done and makes sure that it stays within the uh, bounds of what is normal best practices for a government. And so they look at all of the capital project uh, budget and projects um, and look to see if they're in line with um, what is known uh, throughout the nation for governmental agencies. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Martha, and, and thank you, Jane, for the question. And uh, seeing no other hands and seeing the, the time, it looks like it's, it's getting to be about that time to, to wrap up our meeting for the evening. Um, thank you again, Martha. Thank you to all the presenters and, and all the members of the public who um, we're in attendance today, and, and thank you to Kirsten again for, for helping out with all of the technological needs, and to our volunteers on the redistricting committee. Thank you to everybody, anybody who can hear my voice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, you remember, be sure to uh, join us again next month, the third Thursday, uh, which is October 21st. It's the last day that could possibly be, I think. Is that the way that works? Um, we will uh, we'll be rolling. We'll be doing hybrid. Um, we'll ha we'll have a lot of great information, um, some updates from city councilors, as well as some other updates on on things that are going on in the city. So, thanks again, and, and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, CCTV partners, too. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Have a good evening, you all. Good night.